Okay, the following interview will be conducted with Lisa Summers for the Psychoactive Substances Research Collection at the Purdue University Archives. It takes place on September 3rd, 2021, over the phone. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz, Betsy Gordon Archivist for Psychoactive Substances Research, who is calling from the Purdue Archives. Lisa Summers is dialing in from her own home office in Worcester, Massachusetts. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Stephanie. So can you start by um, telling us who was Helen Bonney? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, she was, uh, to me, she was such a dear, dear mentor. Um, and I think I want to start uh, an introduction of her the way she always introduced herself. So uh, at every training, she told the story of a musical peak experience that she had. So it was a kind of very defining moment, um, moments defining, uh, uh, defining epiphany really of her life and it involved music and spirituality. And um, when I was organizing my thoughts, actually, Stephanie, I had to organize my thoughts about who Helen Bonnie was. And so today I'm coming with that as the kind of centerpiece of my timeline. And then there was before this epiphany and uh, the work that we're going to talk about today at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center is right there, is after that, hmm. um, and then as her life goes on. So um, the first thing is that she was a violinist. Um, her main identity was as a violinist. And secondly, her identity was um, she was the daughter of a minister and the wife of, an, of a minister. And she was raised in a very traditional way, in a very traditional part of the country. From, she's from Kansas. And so um, she was, yeah, she was very much, um, she was a wife and a mother before having any, any kind of career. And um, while she was in that uh, tr very traditional part of her life, um, she played violin for religious services because her husband was a minister. And this experience that defined her life was that as she was playing for this religious service, she had uh, this very overwhelming, deep, deep spiritual connection with God and it came through the music. And so um, for Helen, this experience was the opening of a really deeper internal life. And it's so interesting because of course it, it, it was a peak experience. So it had a strong effect on her in the days and the weeks and the years afterwards. But um, that event really was the basis of a new profession. So she didn't become a music therapist right away, but and that was when she was 28. She didn't find a professional path until she was 40. She became a music therapist when she was 40 years old. And in fact, then I can sort of fast forward to the end of her life because um, by the time she passed away, she was recognized worldwide as a key figure in the development of music therapy. Um, and she was really the, the, a pioneer in the field of music therapy, bringing it forward into humanistic and transpersonal um, theory. And um, sh her method that she developed called guided imagery and music is one of the five named worldwide models of music therapy. Hmm. So there are many other contributions to music therapy as well, but mostly we think of her as a music therapist who was one of the leaders who is was one of the leaders in the field and moving it forward 
um, both theoretically and in terms of providing us with a method. And um, she wasn't so recognized uh, at the beginning of her life, but towards the end of her life, um, she was actually acknowledged in the Grove Dictionary of American Musicians, which is really amazing. That was after her death that she was recognized. Hmm. Thank you. And can you tell us uh, more about who you are? What do you do professionally and what are your research areas? Uh, I'm also a music therapist and um, I think in some ways my uh, entrance into music therapy, although it was earlier, parallels Helen's. Um, but I was a French horn player. I loved playing French horn. And then I found the field of music therapy. Both Helen and I entered the field when it was in a really behavioral period. And so I found Helen when I was rebelling against the behavioral model. And um, I met her at a conference and I picked up my life and my husband, who was almost my husband then, not quite, but picked us both up and moved to Baltimore to study with her. So um, in terms of my connection with Helen, Helen brought my life a deeper meaning um, in that I became a specialist in her method, guided imagery and music. And then I was the director of her, um, of her training. So she had a training in guided imagery and music. And as I think my main responsibility in GIM was grounding it as a psychotherapy. Maybe we'll talk a little more about hmm. that later. Yeah. Okay, and can you think back to that conference that you first met her at? Do you remember what your first interaction was like or what your first conversation, how that unfolded? Mm. Actually, I didn't have a conversation with her then. Um, I was only 22, and I was way too scared mm -hmm. <laughs> to approach somebody who was on the stage. I was very, very shy. Uh, but I can tell you that um, the first time that I met her was uh, I signed up for the training with her to train in her method, guided imagery and music, um, against the advice of my behavioral music therapy teacher, who, by the way, told me, that she was known to be a witch huh. because she practiced some weird, really weird form of music, which wasn't even really called therapy then. So um, I was so rebellious against that teacher when he spoke so badly of her. I thought, yeah, this is perfect, perfect place for me to go. So as soon as I graduated, I picked up and, and um, my first meeting with her was um, she picked me up um, t uh, to go and drive through the country roads in Maryland to go to Port Townsend to the, like the top of a mountain where our level one was going to be held. And my first conversation with her was so revealing actually of who she is as a person hmm. um, because I actually I didn't exactly know what I was doing there I didn't really know what GIM was and she was so um, so forthright in just asking me about my relationship with music I was so young I was 22 and I was really scared of her to begin with Mm -hmm. And to relax me, she just talked about music and she described so vividly. She, she said something like, you know, Lisa, I love music so much. And something like, like what I do is I lie on the floor in my living room and I have two huge speakers and I just put myself right in the middle of those speakers. I lie down and I close my eyes 
And she said, sometimes the music is so intense and beautiful, I just writhe with ecstasy. (laughs) And she was so passionate about music. And for me, it was really scary. You know, she, mm-hmm. I thought of her as such an older woman. I think she was, I don't know how old she was, but, but um, she was so, so genuine. And as a person, she was so amazing. She was so genuine. She was so present. And she was so willing to entice, so good at enticing us to come into the music with her and that was really a part of her a a really big part of her character was a a sort of central piece i'm going back to your question about who helen bonnie was Mm -hmm. in a in a more personal way Mm -hmm. um because it's really it feels good to share that that part of her as well she believed so strongly in classical music She loved classical music so much um, and the aesthetics. She believes so much in the aesthetics of classical music. So my first um, connection with her was not really through GIM. It was really just the pure love of music Mm -hmm. and just talking about music and how at that time I, I was so in love with being a horn player. So we just really talked about music um and so the conference that you were at um so you were a horn player at the time but you found yourself at this music therapy conference were you kind of thinking about pursuing that line of work uh actually so i um i was a music therapist but it only sounds like i wasn't Uh (laughs) because i was a student so I can say it again. Um, I was a mu- I started as a music major, as a music ed major, music education, and then performance. And then I switched schools. I sw- switched schools three times. In college. And yeah, in college. Okay. So my third third college was for music therapy. And that was when I discovered music therapy. I discovered it while I was at the conservatory. And um, when I got into music therapy in college, it was so disappointing. It was so disappointing Hmm. because it was all focused on changing behavior. So I was working with handicapped children and the expectation was that I would have these very specific goals to help them behave better in the classroom and to help them learn, um, you know, learn the alphabet. And it was so, um, it was so frustrating. So I was a music therapy major and I went to a music therapy conference, a national music therapy conference for our organization, which at that time was called the National Association for Music Therapy. Mm -hmm. And that's where I heard Helen speak for Mm -hmm. the first time. I heard her speak about GIM and honestly, I, I hardly heard the words that she said. Hmm. I was so impressed by her presence and by the way she talked about music and the depth uh, of of her uh, the way she talked about music. She was that was the first time I had really maybe that the words music therapy really made sense to me. Hmm. And so for me yeah it sounded like i wasn't i I, I wasn't a music therapist yet but i was a music therapy student um but basically just getting a degree in behavioral music therapy um that was so unfulfilling until i met helen and uh studied gim with her that's so cool you didn't even realize um what you were looking for and it sounds like she yeah she she gave that to you yeah actually i had um because i loved playing horn so much at the point that i met helen i felt like i had turned my back on music Mm 
mm-hmm. because although I was still playing horn, you know, I was using music as a tool. I was playing children's songs on guitar, and I had sort of turned my back on my passion for classical music. I felt I felt that I had. And so when I met Helen, it was really clear to me that what I had turned my back on and that, um, and, and she made my path clear. Hmm. She made it really clear to me um, that I needed to reconnect with the depth of my love and my listening to classical music again in order to go more inside myself uh, professionally and personally as hmm. well. Did she, did she emphasize, or she like, Lisa, you need to pick up the horn again, you need to keep playing, or did she have a different approach? Um, no, I, I, I was still playing, but there was, um, yeah, when I say I turned my back on it, it was from my inner world more hmm. than the external world. Um, but uh, Helen was so accepting, so there was no imperative from her. Um, when I went to my level one, uh, I was really young, and at that time, um, as you can imagine, Helen's work, so in the 70s, which is when I was studying music therapy, and Helen was just giving workshops then, um, her workshops were more like um, personal growth, almost new age, uh, intensive model um, workshops. And although she was training people, she didn't require her students to be therapists. So hmm. I was almost the only, I was hardly a therapist then, but I was almost the only person who was either studying or who was a therapist. It was mostly people who had a lot of new age beliefs and their experiences were about reincarnation and there was a lot of primal screaming going on hmm. at the seminar. And it was really scary for me because I was brought up very traditionally. And of course, I had only known about behavioral, the behavioral use of music. And although I responded very strongly to the music, the whole atmosphere of Helen's first, like the first period of her work after the, um, the LSD research was quite wild and almost too wild Hmm. for me. And so I even went to her and said, I I think I probably don't belong here. And I think I should probably go home. Hmm. And uh, she was so supportive and just, you know, just so warm and encouraging and just asked me to pay attention to my own self and to what was going on within myself. Hmm. And, you know, it was more like her message was like, you know, surely there's a reason that you're here and it's about you. And don't, yeah, there are a lot of things going on, but um, it was it was her voice, it was her pacing, it was her confidence in me, her confidence that um, there was something deeper inside me that I needed to discover was an amazing first connection to her. Hmm. Um, and can you talk kind of generally about what your um, relationship with her looked like in terms of her being your mentor? Like how did it unfold and um, how did it kind of sort of guide your career? Yeah. Um, so that was the beginning, of course. It was so respectful. I think she was so respectful. I was so young. Um, and I think the next, after uh, I was her student, so she was like that the whole time I was in training with her. 
And um, after training with her for, it was just under two years, Helen became very ill. Um, and she had a period of, uh, it was like an early retirement um, of um, right after I studied with her. And so I didn't have all that much contact with her then. But as she started coming back, um, her health started coming back. One of my first encounters with her was um, we were invited to do a seminar together to talk about GIM for people who were in a, a traumatic brain injury program. And we were talking to a group of probably t uh, 15 music therapists and um, it was a really interesting first teaching with Helen because right away I disagreed with her. Um, she started talking about how important it was to take people deeply into classical music in a coma. And I thought, oh my God, you should never do that because the person can't respond verbally. They can't tell you they can't describe, you know, what they're experiencing. So how could you ever know if you were playing music that was adequate, that was nurturing, if that was your intention? Hmm. And so that was our first disagreement. Wow. <laughs> and it was in public. It was in front of a group of people. And it was wonderful. Hmm. And it was right after that that she hired me to come and direct her program. So that says a lot oh, about who yeah. Helen is as a person, is that um, I wasn't hired to be a yes person to her. Um, she hired me because she really respected my clinical work. So while she was on her uh, med sort of medical leave, I had done quite a bit of um, work with GIM, working in psychiatric hospitals, I worked with elderly, I worked with children, and I had spent almost a decade developing and modifying her method. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we came together um, at the Bonnie Foundation, she hired me to direct her training. Her purpose was that she was really ready to ground GIM her method as a depth psychotherapy, as what she would call a, a transpersonal, um, she would call it music psychotherapy, or she would call it humanistic, transpersonal music therapy sometimes. Hmm. So the mentorship was um, at the Bonnie, um, so there was a decade of uh, being the director of her training and developing a training which um, grounded her method, which had been sort of ungrounded more as a, a method for well adults um, and grounding it clinically, um, grounding the, the preparation and the integration after a music experience and containing music experiences. So our mentorship was like a, a real give and take. Obviously she changed my life. Um, and, um, and then she allowed me to change her way of training um, and to help her um, change her way of thinking and experiencing her own method. Hmm. And can you talk more about the impact guided music imagery had on the field. Um, mm -hmm. What, yeah, yeah, what was what was so game changing about it? So um, Helen was so much ahead of her time in the seventies um, because music therapy was so behavioral. There was hardly even any psychodynamic, any kind of depth music therapy. So the first thing is that GIM brought the concept of deeply 
deeply experiencing like listening or playing music into the field. Um, she is known for bringing humanistic music therapy to the fore in music therapy. She's known as bringing the idea that music could actually be a primary modality. So at that time, music therapists all thought of ourselves as an adjunct to psychiatry and psychology. And she believed in what she called music-centered therapy, that the music was actually a kind of therapist and that the music and the music therapist were co-therapists. Hmm. So she brought that concept into the field of music therapy. Um, because she was uh, humanistic, she also believed in deep experience, the therapist's deep uh, self-experience. And so at that time, music therapy had no experiential training, no requirement to be in therapy. And so Helen was a pioneer in that way as hmm. well. Um, and I don't know if you answered this already, but I'll throw it out just in case. How do you think Helen thought about music? And how does that compare to how you think about music? Mm. Oh, that's a deep question, Stephanie. <laughs> um, well, Helen's, um, it, it, I think maybe uh, I should talk a little bit about the LSD research. Okay. Um, or shall we hold off on that? No, we can go right there. Yeah. I'm I'm curious to know if you knew about her involvement in psychedelic research when you first met her and what you thought of that. Yeah. I I didn't really. I was so uh you know, she might have talked about it, but when I very first met her, everything was so wild to me. Hmm. Her behavior was so wild the depth of, of emotion that she was willing to express, um, the way at her seminars, the way she was willing to take people into really deep um, conf conflict, like really dark emotions, um, to match that with music and let people cry and yell and move their bodies and, you know, discharge emotions. Um, I, so uh, she conceived of music as having so, so many therapeutic functions. And I think the roots of that are in her work with LSD. Hmm. And of course, the roots of her beliefs about music, the trans her transpersonal ideas, the roots of that are in her early experience, uh, her own peak experience on the violin. Hmm. So um, there's a, a kind of psychodynamic function of the music for Helen. Um, she focuses so much on the emotions of music and the idea that music can take people so quickly into emotions. And then the transpersonal, the main, her, her core concept um, of, of her use of music is the transpersonal use of music. So, um, let me try to describe that. Um, yeah, transpersonal means going beyond. So it's it's going beyond the personal. But the idea of of the ability of music to take us beyond where we can go uh, in our no uh, by or by ourselves without music. Hmm. So um, there's the idea, and her idea has to do specifically with classical music, because classical music has very um, traditional structures. 
And the structures have to do with setting up expectations within us. It has to do with tension and relaxation. And it has everything to do with um, being in the presence. And then the music goes beyond our expectation and takes us beyond where we could go. It's almost like the music is smarter than we are. The music has interesting solutions to, um, to musical problems or musical conundrums or musical sounds. And the idea is that when we are immersed in the music, that we can follow the music into its, we can follow it through the tension into the relief in a brand new way, that the music can take us to a a brand new place. Hmm. And that's the very definition of transpersonal, is that we want to go beyond our current emotional limitations or spiritual limitations Hmm. and and so helen's formulation is just that music and transpersonal are so perfectly matched and she believed in the aesthetics of classical music that that's what helps us relax that the warmth that the um the beauty of the music that the deep experience of the music helps us to join with it, to become one with it, and then we can go wherever it takes us. Hmm. Her predilection towards classical music is interesting because I could see not everyone being into it or, or, you know, it's, it's, not necessarily a universal sort of Mm -hmm. thing, but it seems like she employed it very strongly. So did she run into trouble with that, with her focus on classical music so much? Hmm. Actually, the, um, I have a theory about it. I have a theory about why Helen became so, What's a good word? I need help with the good word. Hmm. It's fanatical is too strong. Mm -hmm. Obsessed is too strong, (laughs) but focus. Uh So she became such a, um, an advocate. Yeah. Helen considered herself an advocate for the use of classical music in music therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where we have to start. Um, because in her music therapy training, so Helen, like me, was faced with a teacher who believed very fully in using music in a strictly behavioral way. Mm-hmm. And her Helen's teacher was E. Thayer Gaston. And E. Thayer Gaston is known as the father of music therapy. Hmm. So he wielded a really heavy hand in the development of music therapy. And when Helen uh, had her first interview with Gaston, she told him about her musical peak experience. And actually he told her that has nothing to do with music therapy. And he said to her, that's not something you can talk about. I'll let you into my music therapy program, but that kind of experience is not something that you can talk about in my music therapy training. So Helen was forced, uh, not forced, she chose, of course, she chose to go into that training, but she set aside her predilection for classical music and for deep music listening for all of those years of her music therapy study. So I know how that feels, too. I related so strongly to her when I met her because i that's what happened to me as well. I set all that aside. And so 
it's so interesting that when Helen finished her music therapy work with Gaston, they both became employed on, they both became part of a psychedelic team. Hmm. Helen in Kansas because of Ken Godfrey. Ah. Ken Godfrey was in Kansas City, was in, sorry, sorry, was in Kansas. I'm not sure if it was in Kansas City, but it was in Kansas Mm -hmm. at the VA hospital. And the VA hospital brought on E. Thayer Gaston as a music therapist. And Helen moved to Baltimore to the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. So those are two main psychedelic research teams. And they each had a music therapist. And one was Gaston and one was Helen. And they had really, really opposite philosophies of music therapy. Hmm. And if you look at the research, you can see Gaston wrote a report, wrote a research report with uh, Charles Eagle. And the outcome of his study was about not using classical music. And Helen's research was all about the necessity for classical music. So I have a feeling that Helen's, um, that that, um, it, it wasn't an argument at the time when, you know, when she was his student, but Helen was very traditional and very, very respectful of authority. Mm-hmm. So it's not something she challenged for all those years when she was his student. Hmm. But when she got out to do her work, I think that um, exacerbated, I'm not sure of a good word, but it really strengthened her resolve to fight the fight to um, really make our field and to make specifically her own teacher think about the importance of classical music. Hmm. It's so interesting. And I'm, I think it's so interesting. I'm kind of snagged on the fact that he he didn't think that her peak experience had anything to do with music is that music therapy okay music therapy what did it yeah where did it come from then um well i can't speak for e fair gaston Mm -hmm. (laughs) nor should i (laughs) nor should i try i can i can speak for helen um but not for gaston uh but there was such a huge, um, in music therapy, there was such a huge emphasis on proving that music had an effect. Hmm. So the, the, the field was so wedded to a behavioral approach because it was possible to prove and to change behavior and to be able to record it and research it. And at the time, of course, it, it helped our field to become rooted in research, but it took our field a while to grow um, and to expand and to open to different philosophies. So, um, yeah, as I said, I think that was a part of Helen's role was to open up the field. She was such a pioneer to open hmm. up the field. And it seems like she had a deep appreciation for mysticism before she got really involved in music therapy, or maybe during, um, but especially before she got involved in psychedelic research. Do you know how that came about? Well, I think, so the first thing is that she was deeply religious. Um, And, you know, I know Helen, as a person, prayed every day um, when she was younger, when I met her. So I think that her religious upbringing, um, through her peak experience, grew into a broader... Um, maybe grew into a broader spirituality. 
And then I think that broader spirituality opened her to be really questioning. She was so willing to take risks and be in the unknown. And I know that the atmosphere at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center was all about thinking about, um, uh, yes, about psychic phenomena, about like, how is it that we know things that other people are thinking? So I know that they were doing some kind of testing uh, about that as well. So I think that um, being immersed in the psychedelic world opened her to the ideas of mysticism so that I think when she got out, she was actually quite comfortable in that world of new age, the world of um, yeah, just looking at mysticism, looking at past lives, looking at psychic readings. People were doing psychic readings at GIM trainings all the time hmm. in the seventies. So I think she was very comfortable um, in a really broad way, just really questioning what life is about. And she was so accepting of uh, students and peoples, you know, of everyone's beliefs. Hmm. And did she share with you about some of her own psychedelic experiences? Um, because I understand therapists or those who worked at the, the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, in order to administer the substance, I'm of the understanding that it's really important for the therapist to know what they're getting their patients into. So they mm -hmm. experienced it firsthand themselves. Do you know if Helen did? Yeah, I know that she did. Um, she did at least two LSD um journeys and that she did a peyote journey as well hmm. and um at the time that i was training with her which is when she might have talked about that actually i think helen had um had rather good boundaries about sharing her inner experiences she always used her uh certain personal experiences to demonstrate for us as trainees how to grow deeper. You know, what does it mean to grow deeper? What does it mean to express your feelings? What does it mean to have a transpersonal experience? But she really never didn't really share the content of her own therapy. She would sometimes share the content of her internal world but never in a kind of active way. Like, here's what I experienced in my hmm. um, in my psychedelic session. Mm -hmm. um, she did. She left with me, um, gave me the notes um, that she had taken about her psychedelic journeys, um, the personal notes and the professional notes that she made oh. as well. So I, I have those. So it's not that she was that secretive um, about those. Hmm. Oh, gosh, I wonder what she listened to, if she listened to anything during those sessions. Yeah, she did. She did. Absolutely. She planned her own music. Oh, So, um, yeah, and most, almost all of the pieces that, um, so after the, the LSD research, when she developed her method, her main, you know what I haven't even said, that her main contribution is about music programming. So um, that was her main, the, her main development in GIM was the way she programmed music in about half hour chunks, like a timeline of about one half hour. And so almost all of the music that she used in her GIM music programs came from the LSD research and almost all of the music that was effective for her 
in her LSD sessions was used. So she had a special relationship with particular pieces of music that she traveled to in her LSD sessions. Hmm. And then can you just clarify for any listeners what you mean by program? Yeah. So um, Helen is the, uh, in music therapy, Helen is the originator of music programming. And um, that was the cornerstone of her method. So the idea of a music program is um, first you have a pool of music um, and a pool of music is like a playlist. So, you know, on Spotify, you can um, throw all sorts of pieces into a playlist and we would call that a, a music pool. And those are lots of choices of music. And when a, a therapist pulls, uh, takes music out of that music pool and programs it and links them, links pieces together with a specific profile, that is called a music program. Okay. So when you take a playlist and you, you have a specific reason and a specific way, like this piece you should listen to first, this you should listen to second. So it's not a kind of shuffle mm -hmm. idea yeah. um, that's called a program. And, and so in, the, yeah. Sorry, can you clarify what you mean by profile? Yeah, a profile is like a shape. So in the LSD, um, in an LSD session, the, the drug had uh had a profile the effect of the drug had a specific profile um like onset and building and then a peak and then a plateau and then a return so i would call that a shape or a profile okay and it has to do with the it had to do in the lsd work with the intensity of the drug and that's where Helen learned how to program music according to the intensity profile of LSD. And she brought that specific profile first. That's how she started making, she made a program. Her first music program was according to that profile. But then she made different shape profiles some starting more intense and ending in a less intense way. So she had all different profiles hmm. for her, the music programs. She developed 18 music programs that all have different profiles. Hmm. I, um, I know we've already talked about this, but I'm really curious about, and you might not even be able to answer this, but when I think about music and classical music, classical music is informed by music of other cultures, and I think of drumming and kind of drones and things, and I just really wonder, what did she think about that kind of music? Because it's certainly impactful, too. Yeah. So from my perspective, Helen's um, focus on classical music, as I said, came from her attempt to rehabilitate her teacher and the music therapy field, hmm. which wouldn't pay any attention to classical music. Ah. So in some ways, I think for Helen, that was really helpful because, first of all, that was her specialty. Second of all, it was amazingly effective for the LSD work. And when she came out of the LSD work, she was still really focused on classical music. So all of her 18 music programs are classical. 
when I came on board as the director for training program, I had been using lots of different genres, doing GIM with lots of different genres. And Helen was so, so interested in that. Hmm. And so as we developed the structure of her GIM training together, the idea of that was that um, she asked me, she was very specific about keeping the focus, keeping the definition of her method, which we call the Bonnie method of GIM. Her idea was that we should draw a boundary around the Bonnie method, which is the use of evocative classical music with guiding, the kind of guiding she developed. And that was her method. And that had her name on it. And and when we use the Bonnie method, we should only use classical music. Hmm. But in the next period of her life, when we started this training, and that was in about 1986 and up until her retirement, she was so open to the use of different kinds, different genres of music and music from other cultures. And the idea was that it was a kind of parallel. It, the idea was that classical music is not for everyone. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the way we advocated for the uh, like a yin yang of cla- of classical music and then we advocated for diversity and we did that together with the idea of we created a kind of continuum model and the idea was that clients shouldn't be introduced to music and deep listening through classical music because classical music is a kind of more advanced listening. It's so much more complex. And so the way the continuum starts is introducing uh, usually music that the client is listening listening to. And that can be any genre, of course. Mm -hmm. And then introducing maybe the therapist's pool of music as well that is not focused on classical. So that includes music of other cultures um, and simpler kinds of music. And so the idea is that we would take a client on the continuum of therapy and the continuum of music, always moving towards classical. And sometimes clients don't even get to classical music. Hmm. And um, so that was um, more towards the end of Helen's life when she was really open to diverse music, um, listening to diverse music and really enjoying it alongside. She never let go of classical music, but also alongside classical. Uh, It's interesting to hear that story. Um, Thank you for clarifying. So. Now we're rounding out at an hour, and I'm wondering. I, I and now I would just want to jump into the Maryland, like the juice of her experiences at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. But I'm wondering, do you need a break before we do that? Yeah, let's take us maybe five minutes. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Mm-hmm. But now I'd really like to delve into Helen's experiences at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. And okay, let's go. <laughs> I'm wondering if she shared for you what the working environment was like there. You know, Helen was such a polite person. <laughs> and so she wasn't someone who would complain about an environment. Um, so there was never any kind of complaint about the marginalization of her or of music or of women, um, directly. So she certainly didn't do that. And she, um, she, she just would never do that. Um, but it was really telling that the origins of her method 
the origins of guided imagery and music are completely rooted in the evidence of her marginalization hmm. there as a woman. Um, can you talk more about that? Yes. Can I tell that story? Please. Okay. So, um, Helen was a female therapist and, uh, for the LSD sessions, it was required to have a male and a female therapist. Um, when Helen wasn't being used, uh, for a session, she described that she was often put in the role of a hostess. And so there were very often, uh, visitors, people came to visit, especially psychiatrists who came to have their own LSD sessions. And that, of course, the psychiatrists were male, and they would often bring their wives. And Helen described to me and sometimes to our, uh, to a, it, when we were giving a training, sometimes she would tell the story in her training in a vivid way that um, because she had to be the hostess for the wives of the psychiatrists. So one on a particular day, she made a decision rather than go shopping, which was what she was usually expected to do was take the wives shopping, that um, she went into a room and uh, asked the the. Uh, wife of the psychiatrist, uh, if she would like to have some kind of demonstration, like a kind of experience uh, to show, to just sort of demonstrate what was happening with her husband. And so Helen asked her to lie down. She had her close her eyes. She had her music equipment there. And she played her a program of music. And the way Helen explains this story is that um, it was rather, uh, it was sh not only surprising to her, but it was actually shocking to her that uh, this woman had so much imagery. Her imagery was really vivid. Helen guided her, she asked her about the imagery, and she was able to describe really vividly a whole journey with the music. Hmm. And so, um, of course, you can hear um, that must have been so uh, such an amazing discovery for Helen. And she credits that those moments as the discovery, she calls it the discovery of GIM. Oh, wow, is that how it happened? That's how it happened because she was marginalized because both she and the psychiatrist's wife, wife were women and the expectation was that they would do some activity, they would go shopping or whatever women do while their husbands are at work. And so I think it's so amazing that the actual discovery of her method is so centrally located in the marginalization of, I think, both women and music hmm. um, in that the culture of those uh, LSD studies. Yeah, can you talk more about the marginalization of music? I don't quite understand what you mean by that. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe I would just say that the evidence of that marginalization is in the literature, in all of the um, the research studies. Music is known to be such a central component. So in GIM, we call it the co-therapist. And we, in music therapy, we say that there's a triadic relationship. So it's the client, the therapist, and the music. Mm -hmm. The music has a, a really important place and so important that we call it the co-therapist. 
and I actually wrote a chapter of a book to even um, make it more central and call it the primary therapist, mm-hmm. that the music should actually be the the um, element, you know, in that triadic relationship, the music should lead the way. And so if you think about the place of music in the written studies, um, in all of most of psychedelics, I think there is hardly a mention. And there is certainly no article written that has any mention of how music programs are put together. Even if the music is mentioned, it's mentioned in a almost like a cursory behavioral way, like the music had this effect on the client, which therapeutically and um, theoretically is a kind of behavioral model of using music. You know, we use like we we use this piece so that the person could feel sad, or we use this piece specifically for, or this piece of music is a is an onset piece, or this piece of music is a peak piece. Mm-hmm. It's very causal, like a very causal relationship, when in fact those um, the LSD research is so founded in transpersonal therapy in a more humanistic, more holistic way of looking at the person. And so that necessitates a humanistic, a holistic, and a transpersonal theory of music. And I think the the theoretical or the, the sort of protocol, so what is the protocol for music programming? Um, it's just nowhere to be seen hmm. in any of the literature. The only article, of course, is Helen uh, Helen Bonney and Walter Pankey's 1972 article in which she attempts to um, put in writing, you know, her ideas about the ideas that she had about programming at that time. Wow. I would think that would be like fundamental to the, if you were a aspiring music therapist, that would be one of the first things that you learn how to put together a program of music. Mm -hmm. Well, actually in music, in the field of music therapy, most music therapists are using different methods. They're using music making methods. So Helen's method is called in the field of music therapy, it's called receptive music therapy because it's the process of listening to oh, music. Okay. So only in receptive music therapy is music programming that important. Uh-huh. And, and so I think I'm talking more about the field of psychedelics that within the field of psychedelic therapy that music itself, I think um, music itself has had, I think it plays a prominent, such a prominent role in the session. Mm -hmm. And yet in the literature, there is such, it plays such, it seems like it plays such a minimal role. Yeah. I was, uh, that's a perfect segue because I'm curious about, and I don't know if you even know, the the answer to this question, but I'm curious about the therapists at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center who were involved in psychedelic research. I'm wondering what incited them to seek out a music therapist for these studies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's really interesting because um, I have heard two different opinions. Um, sorry, can I say that again? I've I've heard that's not what I meant to say. I've heard the same, a similar opinion from different sources. Okay. The first thing is so. The first thing is um, in reading. Helen's writings, 
Um, what she has written is that although she was employed, uh, she was she was brought onto the team. She was not necessarily brought on as a music therapist, although they were glad she was a music therapist. Hmm. But she was brought on, um, recommended by Ken Godfrey, who knew about her interest in mysticism. He knew uh, he knew her well. They were really, really close. And so um, she was brought on more as a person who was interested in mysticism and transpersonal phenomena than her experience in music. Wow. So that's really, it's so interesting to read that, to read that in her writing. And I recently, um, I've been doing my own research into the um, MPRC and into the culture there. And I found a quote um, from uh, John Reed, um, who was a member of the research team. And it, actually, he says that in his estimation, Helen wasn't really a direct member of the primary team. And so that's a kind of, also a kind of evidence in, um, it's her perspective, but it's his perspective as well. And I think as I've been talking about Helen and her character, at that time, Helen was not a person to rebel against an authoritarian hmm. culture, against a male dominated culture. Um, in fact, uh, I had a sex discrimination fight uh, when I was younger, and uh, I fought the state. I fought the state of Tennessee, and um, when I uh, started talking to Helen about my fight, she was so so nervous for me. Hmm. She was. It brought up so much fear in her. And it was around that time, it was in the, it was around 1991, actually, that I think that my uh, fight for sex discrimination, there was even harassment at my workplace, at my university that I was fighting against. That, um, her support of me, her gradual, um, you know, she gradually lost her fear and really aligned with me and became really much bolder about it. It was then it, that she wrote for the first time the story that I told you. She would tell that story orally and she would use the word, you know, I was expected to be a hostess but she had never written it in all of her writing about herself. Hmm. And it was in, uh, when I collected her writings, I, I uh, edited the collection of her writings called Music and Consciousness. And I think it's chapter three that is called The Discovery of GIM. And so I found one autobiographical um, article that Helen wrote that had a teeny tiny mention of the word hostess. Hmm. And um, so I took that and included that in her book. And then I expanded it in an editor's note to, um, to really make that more evident. Wow. So um, can I go back to your question? And can you remind me of where our question, I'm afraid I got lost in yeah. my no that's so interesting well I was just wondering um what brought her to the Maryland Psychiatric right. Research Center and did they ha did they appreciate music or you mentioned she went there because she had these leanings toward mysticism so did they just they want her they wanted her on board because they needed another female therapist in the room or did you they... know that's my sense wow. and that she came very highly regarded by ken godfrey and and of course i'm sure when she got there they were astounded at the contributions that she brought she was an amazing person she was amazingly present as a guide 
um, amazingly, you know, her, her emotional strength is so evident. Um, and her spirituality is also evident. So she had within her, you know, as a person and as a therapist, she had the ability to delve deeply into darkness and she had the ability to soar in the transpersonal realm. But I think, um, I was mentioning the, this, uh, tribute that I found to Helen, um, by John Reed. And in it, what he talks about is her ability to understand feeling states. So I think that in, from my perspective, her role had to do, and the role of um, women had to do with bringing, um, and, the, and the role of music as well, had to do with that kind of traditional female role of, um, of the one to bring the emotion, the one that's comfortable with the emotion, the one that, um, the person that can open on an emotional level and manage feelings. And of course that went along with the role of music as well. Um, I'm curious now about her relationship with Kenneth Godfrey and I can't recall if she worked at the um, Veterans Hospital in Kansas. Uh, you know, I think she did a music therapy, a, a very traditional music therapy research project there. I'm not sure if it was at the same hospital, but her relationship with Ken Godfrey um, was a kind of exchange um, because she was really interested in med. She did a lot of meditation, and so she did meditation with him, and he did hypnosis with her. Hmm. So she actually had a, a quite extensive uh, hypnosis therapy with him. And in exchange, she taught him about meditation. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a nice, that's a nice professional duo. Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, another thing I'm wondering about is when she landed at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, um, with her gift for music therapy, um, was that appreciated by the staff there? Or did she have to push to make that an agenda item? Or, you know, did they, did the therapists, did the clinicians there who were there already say, well, yeah, I'd like to use my playlist for this one. Did she butt heads with anyone there in that regard? Mm -hmm. um, I, when Helen came on board, the psychiatrists and the therapists there were already using music. And so it's not that Helen brought the music there they already had their own records. They already were programming music before she got there. Okay. And from my understanding, the person who Helen was closest with was Walter Pankey. Oh. I think he was an amazing, amazing advocate for her and that they were quite close. And so I don't know exactly, but I'm imagining that they're thinking on the topic of music was quite similar. Mm -hmm. So um, I also know that Helen was quite close with uh, Ilsa Richards uh, and Bill Richards as well. So um, those are the names that she spoke about most uh -huh. um, as sort of advocates. And I'm thinking that they probably had a similar kind of mindset so, but the thing is that Helen herself was a neophyte about doing therapy. Remember that Helen's um, training in therapy was only behavioral. So this was the first time that Helen was immersed in a kind of therapy that really 
included the inner world that really delved into the inner world Hmm. and so she had um you know that was her amazing learning and i think that um from my from my perspective hearing her talk her role was to look at what was already going on so Um, She was very interested in the therapist's uh, already established pool of music. And she studied that pre-established pool. She did a research study, for example. She she, uh, took a survey and she laid out the different phases, the different drug phases, the profile, as I described it. Mm -hmm. And she asked the therapists which pieces they felt fit into those profiles more. And so I think Helen saw her role as an organizer and as a programmer and um because they i think that they already had the strategy of using classical music um and only using the client's music for the beginning and the end of the profile and that philosophy stayed so she agreed with that philosophy as well Hmm. but i think what helen did was to organize Um, was to learn how to program um, and to begin to root it in some reasoning to develop. You know, she had a protocol for doing her own music programming. And um, we know more about that. Like, I know more about that because that's what she did in GIM. But in 1972, she hadn't made all those 18, you know, pre-designed mm-hmm. GIM programs. They were making spontaneous programs for each of the clients wow. um, in the LSD research. Hmm. And you mentioned a seminal article sh- she wrote with Walter Pankey in 1972. Can you talk about why that was such a big deal? Well, first of all, it's the only one. Hmm. It's the only article that um, delves into how to program music. And, um, you know, from those from the LSD work, um, there is one researcher now, actually Mendel Kalin, who is focused, he's a neuroscientist, and he is, I think, probably my... Uh, yeah, he's my my colleague, my closest colleague in advocating the um, a, a, advocating a client centered protocol for music programming. So, but that's current. You know, that's in the current trends. Hmm. Um, so, in the past, uh, for sure. Um, the Bonnie Pankey article is the only one that exists. And um, it was right before, actually it was published after Pankey's death, um, written before his death, obviously, but published after his death. So um, it articulates a philosophy. It it articulates a philosophy and it starts to try to articulate a protocol, but doesn't quite do that. Hmm. And unfortunately, this article has been used to perpetuate, I think, to perpetuate the idea of using a single playlist um, when that wasn't Helen Bonney's intention at all hmm. in writing this. Um, I think this article is really misunderstood. Oh. So I'm working right now on republishing that article. I have permission, received permission from the Music Therapy Association to reprint it and to, um, to provide and my own interpretation and a, a sort of a correction of the way that article is usually interpreted as a sort of basis for using uh, a classical 
program, you know, a, a particular classical program and trying to pull her reasoning out to justify, uh, to justify that. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm torn because I don't, I don't know. It, it, I'd love to talk more about um, how playlists or be, or sorry, programs um, are being put together today. But I'm still a little snagged on the working environment at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. And let's go back there. Yeah, be yeah. Did you? Because there's so many researchers who are interested in. Well, what was it like there? What did it look like? What did it feel like? Um, and Helen was, or, yeah, Helen was one of the few women on the staff um, mm -hmm. who wasn't a nurse. Not yeah. that a nurse is a bad thing, but there is a hierarchy there. So, mm -hmm. did she share anything more? About that. I'm I'm very curious about race too, to to be frank, because there's things that I see um in our print collections here that are very it's not overt, but it's like, oh, it's it was a different time back then. Mm hmm Yeah. It sure was. And um, you know, Helen was brought up, as I said, Helen was brought up in Kansas, in a very conservative family, and a very white part of the of the country as well. So um, I don't know that much about the diversity of races there. I actually don't know anything about that. Um, and I can't say that Helen ever really specified exactly but I think in some way she didn't need to specify I think the evidence is in her story about being a hostess mm -hmm. and I think that's really for me Stephanie that's really important actual documented evidence to hold on to that a person who was a part of the team, you know, a part of the study team and a part of the primary study team would be asked to take someone's wife out for shopping, mm. shopping. is so denigrating. It's, it, it tells you about the atmosphere and, um, Maybe the second thing I would say, just kind of going back, um, the the statement that I have by John Reed, it's so interesting because the thing I learned about discrimination is the discrimination itself is so oppressive. So that's the first thing is that you can imagine we can imagine the environment or how it was or how Helen was viewed that she would be a shopping agent. Um, mm. We can infer a lot mm -hmm. from that evidence. And the second thing about a culture of discrimination is that it's um, not only is it there, but it's stated in an open way, right? So nobody's embarrassed about that. Yeah, yeah. When the culture is discriminatory, no one is hiding that. It's like, yes, of course, Helen will do that. Or if Helen is not there, what other woman can we get mm -hmm. to do this task? I think that's so implied. So when I look at this statement by John Reed, it's, it's like um, his... Clearly, Helen was an amazing contributor, and she was a member of that primary team. Clearly, she was. But in a written statement, John Reed is so willing to say, Helen wasn't really a direct member of the primary team. 
and she was really valued and she made a, a great contribution. But um, she, was, she was really the one who focused on feelings. So it's like there's not a, there's not an embarrassment. There's no, embarrassment's not the right word. There's no um, censor. When discrimination happens in a culture, it's also not censored because there's not an awareness about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Helen was used to that kind of discrimination. And at that time, Helen was not comfortable. I can tell you that very clearly that Helen was not comfortable standing up and saying, you know, saying anything about gender inequality. Mm. And I know that because of the way she responded, because of her personal response to me when I made a decision to fight my university. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so, and I know about that idea, you know, that was what my fight was about too. It was not only about, it was not only about the discrimination itself, but it was that um, it was done so openly, mm -hmm. which of course, by the way, by the way, makes it easier to fight sex discrimination <laughs> mm. because there's evidence. Yeah. So I can look at, um, we can look at this the comment about Helen that's put in writing because, and there are probably other comments put in writing about women. We can look at that and we can use that as extra evidence that the um, environment was uh, filled with gender inequality because there is no censorship of it because mm. people are speaking about it and and saying the attitude a denigr denigratory attitude towards women in an open way and in writing yeah you know it makes me wonder at the time if it was so normalized, did she realize how impactful that was, that she was marginalized in that way? Did she That's see right. it? That's right. Do you That's think a good she question. Did? Yeah, I no, I think she was so used to it. Ugh. I think it was just a, a very natural part of her life. Yeah. Um, I think it's also, uh, it's a part of the health care system as well. Uh -huh. Um, you know, that, that gender equality, um, and the, the inequality that, yeah, music therapy is such a young field as well. So, um, so there's that kind of, there was that kind of a challenge that not only was she a woman, but she was in a little respected field and a little known field as well. Yeah. Um, I also wonder, I'm curious, it seems like she kind of packed up her life um, and moved from the Midwest to the East. And I'm wondering, she seemed professionally driven, um, but I would imagine she had to move her family um, and that moving to Maryland was a pretty significant thing for her. Um, and I just wonder, like, well, you know, she she probably didn't want to shake, rock the boat too much uh -huh. because she was employed, yeah. you know? And, um, and, you know, probably wanted to you know, hold on to her job. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, did she ever yeah. talk about being f feeling a little precarious in that regard? Um, she didn't. But one thing to remember is that um, the traditional part of Helen's life, uh, she was in a very traditional situation uh, up until the uh, up until she moved to Baltimore, but that was uh, was it for uh, she was about forty five years old I think, 
So this is really the second half of her life. The kids so, were grown and... Yeah, the kids were all grown. Um, and so she'd been married for a long time. Um, I'm not sure. I know that she divorced her husband. I can't think of the order that that happened in. I'm not really sure. But certainly her kids were all grown. It's like Helen had um, Helen had two lives. Um, she had her very traditional life. And then came the LSD work the GIM work, and then she had a really ill, that she had serious medical problems for almost a decade. Hmm. And then she had another phase of her professional life in which she um, came out of that sort of medical leave and she was really open to diversity. So that last phase of her life was when she started opening more to the continuum model of GIM, listening to more diversity in music. Um, you know, around that time was my lawsuit as well. So she was much more open. And, um, and maybe the, uh, the main part of that was her willingness to ground GIM instead of being in, you know, being ungrounded in a sort of new age uh, personal growth method. She was really ready for the depth of psychotherapy and mm. to to ground her method in that. So um, I think that was a kind of she had an awakening with her peak experience. She had more awakenings in um, in the LSD work, but I think that last period in her life was more the kind of awakening that you're implying. Uh, where she really became aware of her marginalization. Um, she became more aware of the marginalization of women, um, of the restrictedness of just using classical music, um, opening to different uh, modalities of therapy and um, yeah, really expanding. Um, I guess the word that comes to me is flexibility, that she became more open and more flexible and more uh, aware culturally hmm. at that point. And, um, and when the, the research at the Maryland Psychiatric Center started to taper off and end, do you know how she pivoted career-wise? Did that coincide with kind of the time where your paths crossed, or was that a little bit earlier? Um, around, it was around 1970 that the, um, that the LSD research stopped, and right away she got involved with Dan Brown, who was, um, I think he was a peripheral part I'm not quite sure if you, I think he was a peripheral part of psychedelic research, but he was doing um, crisis intervention in Massachusetts. And he started um, consulting Helen with music programs. So he was actually like, a, he like commissioned Helen to make music programs for the college students that he was working with who had been on bad trips, uh, you know, who were suffering from flashbacks. And he asked her to make uh, some music programs with uh, different profiles that would help those students. And that was Helen's, um, that was actually a really great segue. So it's around exactly that time zone. Um, she credits the discovery of uh, GIM, the date that she gives is 1970. And so it was just right around that time that she was starting to think about how to uh, do, how to use music without the drug LSD mm -hmm. and just replace the drug with uh, deep relaxation. And so it was at that time that she developed GIM. She started her own training program in 1973. 
Uh, she started making more programs with different profiles. She decided to get her PhD, which was a really great thing. She developed, so eight of her programs were developed in conjunction with her uh, doctoral dissertation work. So the rest of the 70s for her was the development of GIM. Hmm. And that was when I went into training with her as well. Okay. And that and so that period ended at the end of the seventies when she had medical issues. So that was really fertile. Like that was the the um uh the fuel up from that. The fuel came from the L S D work mm-hmm. and she was so, so fertile, uh, you know, pr- uh, professionally fertile at that time. Just so much development of her method. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I'm just pulling this out of thin air or not, but it seemed like when she was at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, she was pretty academically involved. I, she was publishing, right? And she didn't have to. It's not like they had tenure there, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And Actually, she, did, she, was, she was not really publishing yet. Huh. So even though she was in her 40s. So she just came to music therapy in 1960. 1960 to 1968, she was in her music therapy training Hmm. in Kansas. And so um, the period, the LSD period was then in 68. So even though she was older, she was just finishing her her undergraduate degree was from Oberlin was in violin performance mm-hmm. so her her academics were in the 60s and she did publish her um, her master's thesis so it was a kind of traditional music therapy study hmm. uh, that I think was at the VA so she had one publication um, and she was uh, for sure she was well, well versed in research because um, Ethe Ergassen focused so much on research. Hmm. So she had really excellent um, training in research, but she was just out of her master's degree. Hmm. And what, I'm trying to think timeline wise, when did she get her master's degree? Do you know? Yeah, so it was, uh, I think she went there in the 1960, and she graduated in 68. And that was in Kansas? In Kansas, okay. correct. And then... Um... And then 68, immediately upon graduation, then she uh, moved to take the position yeah. uh, with the LSD okay. research. Hmm. Um, and it seems like when that research ended, that's when things started to take off for her in a way. Well, she believed so much in the power of music to bring transpersonal experiences. There was no way Helen was going to (laughs) stop. She was Hmm. so warmed up. She was so interested in music programming and she was so skilled in the combination of, of music and guiding. So a part of Helen's skill was to put on a really strong piece of music and use a strong voice and help someone go into a deep feeling or a really high state of ecstasy. She was so amazing. She would just join with the music and just speak as if she was an instrument in the music. Hmm. So that combination, that idea of the triadic relationship, you know, of being with the client, of being in the, of choosing the music, of playing the music, of being in the music with the client, and of helping the client travel in their inner world. She was so immersed in that with the LSD. And then her wonderful discovery, her anti-hostess discovery, let's call mm-hmm. it, um, her, her discovery that actually music brings imagery, music brings deep feeling, 
without the um, the need for the LSD. Hmm. So that really inspired her, and that was the tr- I think that was the spark that really helped her to start. Uh, um, focusing on the idea of making music programs and of making a specific method that was a replication of the uh, of the shape of the way the LSD research went, with the goal of making a, a musical peak experience. Hmm. And, so that's the heart of her method. And it took off. It really took. Like it's. Yep. It's extremely well known there's been a music therapist who visited the archives here who is interested in her work she's just gone on to have such an impact um and what is it yeah. what what is it about her? i mean because you know there's a lot of people who do significant academic work but hers really took what was it about her contribution that was so salient to others Mm -hmm. you know i think that um her character is so genuine and her relationship with music is so deep and so that's what drew me to her. So if you're asking why, how did Helen make such a strong impact? The way she made an impact on me was it was her companionship with music. So Helen was so able to convey the, the idea of the power of music and um so i think she really drew drew people to her so when she opened her institute she started drawing people and i think it has to do with also it you know in the 70s it was just the sort of the start of the experiential movement and the uses of music were more um surface level so I think that I think it has to do with her genuine presence and the way she brings music to people in such a vital way. You know, it's filled with her vitality, with her bravery, uh, with her risk taking, like go into this music and it's going to be wild. Um, you know, that her her idea of of lying in the middle of the speakers and listening in ecstasy um, is, I think, something that people are really seeking. Hmm. Um, what do you think she would think of what's happening in psychedelic therapy today, music-wise? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that question hurts. Oh dear. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I think Helen would be so disappointed in the idea of of a single playlist being used the idea that music is being programmed in a profile, in a singular profile, without being individualized. Mm. Um, Helen focused so much on the emotional content of music and on the emotional content of the person and the idea of meeting a person's emotions. And you can't meet a person's emotions. Like when a person is sitting in front of you, they have an emotional, I call it emotional home base. Like they're sort of centered in their emotional world. And you need to be able to bring um, 
if music is going to be a companion, if music is going to be an emotional companion, you can't do that in an impersonal way. Or, or maybe you can, you can reach one out of a certain number of people, but it's not the way to use music in a therapeutic way. It's the way to use music, you know, um, uh, when you're in the supermarket mm -hmm. or, you know, when music, lots of people program music, there's lots of companies that program music to make us do lots of things. And that's based on a behavioral framework. But Helen's humanistic idea is that the therapist's relationship with music and the therapist's in the moment relationship with the client is what's going to affect a session. Hmm. And so the idea of plopping a playlist, one playlist for every client is so opposite of Helen's idea of what's therapeutic about music. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered. So that part, she would be, I think she would be appalled mm -hmm. at that idea. And I think she would never have envisioned that, um, that that would be the outcome of, um, and it's not, that's not what everyone is doing, mm -hmm. but the idea of being more centered, um, being much more centered on the client mm -hmm. themselves is really a, a, just a foundational um, element to a humanistic, in-depth use of music. Um, yeah, I was wondering, are you, do you, you know, you're, um, you have a highly, it sounds like a highly involved academic appointment. Do you still practice guided um, music? Guided imagery and music? Yeah, sessions? Yeah. GIM. Uh -huh. It's easy. Okay. <laughs> GIM. Um, yeah, I had um, I had a practice, and uh, a few years ago, I took a sabbatical so that I wouldn't get too rusty. But I have a training in GIM in the Continuum model of GIM. So I am not in practice now, but I am getting to my retirement and looking forward to going back into practice and doing more training. So I have a full-time uh, uh, position as director of the music therapy program here at Anna Maria College in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and I have an international uh, training program um, for the body method and especially for the whole continuum model. So using the clinical flexibility um, that we started at the Bonnie Foundation. So, um, no, so I'm not practicing clinically right now, but I have many years of experience. Mm -hmm. And um, how are you involved with the psychedelic uh, reemergence that we're experiencing today? Mm -hmm. um, so right now I am involved um, in on two teams. One is in Copenhagen. It's at the University Hospital in Copenhagen. And uh, it's a group that's working with, uh, uh, we, we've been doing a music program for alcoholics. Um, and here at home, very close to home in Boston, there is an amazing team led by uh, Yvonne Bosant. And we are working on a pilot study with 15 hospice patients. And so I'm developing a protocol um, with this group for the 15 hospice patients um, that will be enrolling very soon, actually. And when you say you're developing a protocol, do you, does that mean um, like a, a play, a program? Yeah, <laughs> it means, it means um, I am, 
I well, what I've done is to go back to the 1972 article and really dive deeply into that article. It's like a refresher for me to come back into the GIM program. So of course, I've been programming music for 40 years, um, you know, from when I started in GIM and now applying that. So I'm applying the protocol that I use in my GIM session. So when I sit with a person and select music and make a profile, I'm taking that GIM protocol, like the procedure that I developed and modifying and expanding it for this study. Hmm. Um, and you know, you're directly involved in cultivating the next generation of music therapist professionals and, uh, invariably it seems like psychedelic research is kind of beginning to become a part of the landscape. So, and let me know if this question is too broad, but what do you think the most important thing it is to impart to this next generation? Um, those yeah. who are incorporating so, music into these psychedelic sessions. Yeah. So there is a group um, from, we have a community that's, it's a guided imagery and music community. And there are some people from the generation, um, from the older generation, who are more sort of new age, um, some are not therapists, um, and then there are more newly trained GIM therapists who have um, become more open and flexible with the approach of to GIM, like the continuum model uh, groups. And so I think what's, what's important to know is that from Helen Bonney's 1972 article, the GIM community has been using Helen Bonney's programs, have been using Helen Bonney's programs, and our community have been involved in making new music programs. So in various ways, we have been continuing along the lines of psychedelic research without the psychedelic, but we've been developing ways to program music. We've been developing theories. We've been developing guiding techniques. And um, so I think that this community has a wealth of knowledge to share, actually and um, about the about how to program music. And I can only speak for myself that it has been so incredibly fascinating to work with a study team um, who have a specific concept, uh, kind of like what Helen did with the LSD work that those psychiatrists had specific ideas, already conceived ideas of music. So it's so interesting to be able to understand those ideas, to understand my ideas, and to develop a protocol together. Hmm. So in on my team, it's not like I am coming imposing my idea, and it's not like the psychiatrists are imposing their idea upon me but it's been a really amazing uh, kind of equality. Like they have some knowledge and I have some knowledge. Um, it doesn't feel like, by the way, there's gender, it doesn't feel like there's gender inequality or that there's a marginalization of music or music therapy and the way I've been speaking about that happened to Helen. Mm -hmm. So in some way, this feels like such a great opportunity. It's like a revitalizing of where Helen was, maybe of what Helen was not able to have the power to speak out about and to do. 
Um, but it's an amazing opportunity decades later to be able to continue the amazing work that she did. Mm. It feels so satisfying. It feels like such an amazing meeting of the transpersonal world and the music world. Um, and, it, and I just feel so, yeah, it just feels like a great and important time for music to become more, to be able to be more central and appreciated. Hmm. Oh, I, I hope she's smiling down at the, um, the potential yes. and the new landscape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, is there anything you'd like to add or talk about that we didn't talk about? Mm, I don't think so. I think your words are so nice to end, Stephanie. Just that idea of a new landscape that um, it's so amazingly bursting forth. You know, it's like, uh, it is exactly like a new landscape that we, I think we get to populate that landscape or we, we get to watch that landscape blossom. And I think it's so ripe um, and has so, so much potential. And it's so exciting because, yeah, the, the whole point, the whole, um, the point of going beyond is that it's time to do that again. It's time for a new landscape and to go beyond mm. um, the restrictions of the past. So that feels like a really cool, exciting way to end with your words, new <sighs> landscape. Yeah. And whoever is listening to this 50 or 100 years from now, oh my gosh, what's the landscape going to look like <laughs> yeah. then? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> fascinating well thank you so much lisa for taking the time thank to you. share your thoughts of helen and share your your own experience in this field thank you i think researchers... thank you it's been really great to talk about it okay um when when this concludes our interview <laughs>